Now, I'm not going to say I, I, I know Christian, but we have, we have met a couple of times and we have talked online as well. So, Christian, I have a certain idea on, on, on your, how much pain in the ass I can be asking questions. <laughs> I had dinner with him yesterday and also warned him that I like to do the difficult questions. And Andrew just walked straight into the trap on this one. <laughs> so back in Norway, at one of the universities there, there's a biometrics lab that are rated as one of the best in the world. And every time they uh, want to do a panel discussion, they uh, contact me because they say that I'm really incredibly good at being the devil's advocate. So I wanted to start out by saying that on my phone right now, I'm actually looking at a couple of slides from someone named Simon Yusufsson at a company called Ubico. And these slides are actually from PasswordsCon in June 2011. Oh, wow. In Bergen, Norway, where he was presenting the YubiKey. And very shortly after his talk, I purchased my first YubiKey. And this is then <laughs> 11 years old. So my first question is for Andrew. What's taking you so long? Thank you. Um, how much time do we have before the next session? Uh, uh, well, after this session, there's uh, one hour break. So oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is this on? So uh, great question. Um, you know, I'd note that so Fido Alliance, for those of you who don't know, we're an industry body. Over 250 companies take part. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have all the platforms involved, uh, Yubico, security key vendors, service providers, groups like that. We're coming into our 10th year of existence. So this is around 11 years ago that Yubico had the idea of the YubiKey. Um, I actually think we've made remarkable progress with the FIDO standards. Web, I mean, Christian talked about WebAuthn. WebAuthn is supported by uh, dozens of leading brands. Hundreds of millions of consumers can log in, re-authenticate without a password thanks to that. And what we're hitting though is a point of, well, that's good, but to really take on passwords and to have the same ubiquity as passwords, we need to take on some of the same traits, which is easy access, ubiquitous access, and ease of use. And I could say like today, every conversation I have about FIDO begins and ends with usability. And so pass, you know, pass keys first and foremost are a more usable means of doing passwordless authentication, which allows us to hit our core goal of reducing industry reliance on passwords. Um, so I think we've made good progress in 10 years actually. The fact that we've seen such adoption Every meaningful company is taking part in FIDO Alliance. There's no counter standard to FIDO because everyone understands that this is, you know, FIDO is basically the SSL of user authentication. Um, it's, that, it's that critical and I think we need to have the same approach and we'll have the same success as far as being embedded in every system, service, and platform out there. Um, now, in regards to Yubico and the YubiKey, as Christian was talking about before, that's another form factor for doing, you know, FIDO authentication. And in fact, I would say you know, that will remain the gold standard from a security standpoint for FIDO authentication. There are certain use cases where a key, you know, will always be used. That being said, what is so exciting about Passkey is a proposition of taking passwords out of play entirely for hundreds of millions, if not billions, of consumers. And if someone can't get excited about that, I don't know, you know, what they're waiting for. So to answer your question, I think we're making good progress. Passkey stands to take us to the next level after this. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Tim. FIDO, U2F, WebAuthn, PassKeys. Can you explain this to my mom in like a sentence? What is this stuff? Because my mom is really, <laughs> seriously not interested. Yeah, I mean, I think what, you know, what Christian demoed um, the way we explain it to folks is that you're using your screen lock on your device to sign in everywhere, right? That, that's ultimately the way we abstract it away because the same tech on the device is being used and all of the, all the API service, all that's completely abstracted away from the user. And that's why we believe having a term password, pass key like password is so critical because all we need people to do is associate that as they can sign in. The, the way we kind of thought about this was we're about, 10 years into tap to pay, right? I think Google Wallet came out in 2012, Apple Pay was after, right? Like most users know what that tap to pay icon means now, whether it's a physical card tap or a phone, we need that on the web, we need that for apps. So we need an icon and a name that users just know, oh, all I have to do is, you know, I'm gonna get prompted to 
to unlock my phone more or less to do this or, or my device. If I can add one thing to that, I, I think um, up until a year ago, we, we weren't quite ready with this experience yet because we were always thinking, a user will have to know, do I have a password? Do I have a passkey? They have to make that mental decision. And that was actually a big flaw, right? In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in the development of this, it's like users don't know. Today, if you have a security key, you need to know you have a security key because you need to have it present, right? The thinking with passkeys is everything is abstracted away. Like, like with a password manager today, you just go where you want to go, you click into the field, and whatever's available magically pops up and gets presented. And until we really had that experience figured out, I think this wasn't really ready for prime time, but because we now have it, we're hoping that it is. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Christian. Um, throughout the years, I've seen all kinds of authentication schemes come up and fall down like dead flies in, in seconds. I've got to be honest, I do have a certain level of faith in FIDO Web Authn, but again, I'm here for being the devil's advocate. So I've seen Facebook. Uh, tried to push two vital authentication a couple of years ago. And one of the things I got fascinated when Facebook was really pushing two vital authentication is that after enabling two vital authentication, you would get a pop up for like every time you logged in for a period of at least two weeks where they said, You have enabled two vital authentication. Would you like to turn it off? And I was like, Wait, what? I do know people at Facebook, so I asked about this, and they said, well, it's pretty simple, Pair. When you have 1.5 billion users in the world, there are going to be some people that are clueless, absolutely clueless, to what they just did. So they, they had to do that just to make sure that people, at some level, knew what they were doing. Apple have also tried to push the adoption of two-factor authentication, for your Apple account. Google is pushing the advanced protection program. Will Google, when will you try to push the use of FIDO Web Authn onto users, like to make it mandatory for, let's say, just a couple of million users, just to right. see what happens? That, that's a great question. Um, I was looking for the meme, but then I decided, no, I have too many tabs open on my browser. I don't want to go there. I was looking for that meme with a guy riding the bike and then putting the stick into the wheel, right? I feel like that is what Facebook was doing when they, they tried to get like two-factor authentication adopted and then giving users these options to keep turning things off. I'll, I'll answer the question kind of twofold. The first is Google is on a journey to enable two-factor authentication mandatory for a billion users. Doesn't matter if you want it or not. You're going to get it. And I mean, Apple has already, to a certain extent, done some of that stuff on the iCloud side, right? Today, it's very, very hard. If you have an iCloud account, it's hard to turn off two-factor authentication on that iCloud account, right? There was never an explicit moment where I turned 2FA on my iCloud account, but it's been there for as long as I can remember. And that's a conscious choice and a conscious decision they made. We're doing the same thing. I think we just publicized that we've enabled it for, I think, 150 million users. If you go look at the Google blogs, uh, Google two-factor, like you'll see some... Uh, stuff that we've said about like successfully testing this out. Like we, we took 150 uh, million users, we've enabled two-factor authentication for them, we looked at their account health over like a six-month period and see what happened. Can they still log in? Can't they log in? Now, okay, I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this with, that was like a pretty good group of users we pick, right? They have recovery options, there's other things that's good about their accounts that made us want to go and pick them, but it worked out and we're definitely on a journey to get two-factor authentication in general to more users. Now, let's talk about WebAuthn. The reason why my counterparts in Google on the account side is so excited about WebAuthn is you can sell WebAuthn as a usability benefit, right? You can't, it's hard to sell two-factor as a usability benefit, right? It really is purely a security benefit and users don't care. They're like, you should keep me safe. They're really angry at you when you let someone else get into their account, but for the most part, they don't want to deal with it, right? They're more angry if you lock them out. I mean, that's obviously the worst, right? So lockout is bad, getting someone else to their account, bad, and then of course, for the rest of it, they don't want to deal with it. The way that we're thinking about positioning WebAuthn is exactly what we've seen in that, in that banking demo. You'll sign into your Google account one day, and you'll just get a message that says, hey, you happen to be on a device with a biometric sensor. Like, you can have a fingerprint or a face or whatever. Do you want to use that to make your signing process easier in the future? And then the user says, yes, now they have a passkey. Now, that is, that is the experience that we're thinking about for Google accounts. That is the experience that actually um, many apps have been, have been you know, pushing 
users towards for the last almost decade, right? If you log into your Chase or Bank of America or whoever, like right, into your banking app today, that's the way that the, the app upsells you. Hey, do you want to use biometrics in the future? I mean, I'm not always a fan of the, of the ex exact user experience and how slick it is, but what we want to do is make it extremely easy for users and have the value proposition center around usability and ease of use and not around security. Of course, it's massive for security, but that's not what users, I think, in general, really care that much about. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, sort of tempting to, to, to ask Tim the same question. I, I can't really remember seeing Microsoft doing a very significant, a very visible push for two-factor authentication. But uh, are you planning to sort of push so FIDO Web both then onto us, and is that going to be voluntary or by sheer force? I'll take one little brag. We were the first of the three to allow you to remove your password completely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was about a year ago, and that's been wildly successful. Yeah, we, we are certainly thinking about the day when we would mandate 2SV, um, uh, and that would be via, most likely via passkey or security keys. Um, so it's certainly top of mind. Yep. This is, a, as Christian mentioned, right, this is a journey. This, these releases that you're going to see very shortly, this is not the end, right? We're going to constantly improve yep. and, you know, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be realistic. It'll be about 12 to 18 months before, you know, we can really start to push this on, on these big accounts. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, I mean, I what, what are you doing from, from FidoLine centrally to sort of like, I, I don't know, can, can you ask all the members of FidoLine to push this stuff at the same time so we get the maximum attention to it or, or yeah, how I mean, do you do that? Yeah, so a couple of points here. So first of all, I think the questions are fascinating because to me they're all about usability. The question to Tim, the question about your mom or whoever it might be. My, 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 my mom is incredibly difficult on this. But your I, mom, it's, but like it's always your mom or your grandma, whoever it is, like, you know, yeah. it, it's that, that proverbial person, but it's all about usability. And, you know, and to that person, it's, it's like, you know, Apple has done a great service to the industry by introducing Touch ID. And Apple basically consumerized user authentication with Touch ID. And people are so accustomed now to using biometrics, that's the expectation of user experience. Uh, the Facebook um, experiment with trying to mandate uh, two-factor authentication and sticking the, the, the stick in the spoke, that's a usability challenge. And these are not technical challenges. So again, as I said before, pretty much every conversation I have about FIDO these days begins and ends with usability, which was not the case 12 months ago. It was about security. Um, and all the benefits of usability actually have obviously security implications as well. They have um, bottom line benefits and top line benefits too. Um, and so to your question of can we just make people do this, well no we can't. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you know, on May 5th of this year, we had a press announcement with Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Fido Alliance where all three platforms announced their commitment to support this vision of passkeys. And you know, we can't do much better than that, right? And all three platforms are going to support this, starting with iOS and Mac OS this year, following with Android and, uh, and Windows over the next 12 to 18 months. So I think that as that endpoint support becomes more and more prevalent, we will see the service providers, you know, go towards passkeys. And there's a lot of discussions right now about how and when and why they need to do it. Um, to be clear, as Tim just pointed out, like this is a technology in development. Right, so the technology is mature, right? It will be, it's already out in iOS and in beta form right now, but like any new technology, it does need to iterate. It will iterate based on market feedback, based on market forces, and we're taking, you know, that feedback's happening organically and also through the alliance itself, so that passkey over time will become more and more, um, you know, better tuned uh, and also fit all market demands. One other point that we're doing inside of FIDO Alliance, you know, we're not just hearing about usability, we're actually embracing it as a standards organization to everything we do. So we have a UX committee, we have a UX system coming into place, looking at user experience at every step of the way across our specifications and across our outputs. So Passkey will be front and center, but we're also looking at things like UX for security keys and other deployments of FIDO authentication. Uh, how can we, again, the usability is a very good point. I do have a t-shirt today. Uh, friend in Israel, Avid, uh, called uh, Security Tigger or Sec Tigger on Twitter. He has a rule, Avid's rule, uh, he says, security at the expense of uh, usability comes at the expense of security. Uh, it's a really good one. Um, is FIDO, you know, is it easy for normal people just to get started or do we actually have to do any kind of training to get them stuck with this. I mean, again, back to my mom. 
can she figure this stuff out without any kind of training at all? Because training is a cost. So, so let me talk about the user perspective, then turn over to Tim and Christian yep. and talk about the you know the developer's perspective. So WebAuthn again is, is a remarkable um, API, and it's built in every browser, and anyone could basically deploy it today for you know use of platform authenticators. That being said, um, you know we heard from service providers like, hey, this is really exciting, but like there's some wonky stuff happening with like OS prompts and browser prompts and like, we don't know if this is being, you know, how do we deploy this? And so we actually did our first UX study last year. We hired an external UX firm. Um, we had a UX, we had a committee um, led by, you know, not your typical standards wonks, but by UX and design leads from companies like Visa and Apple and Intuit and JP Morgan Chase, who helped sc scope a study the three-part study that both um, moderated and unmoderated testing of people actually trying to enroll and leverage a platform authenticator to log in to a site supporting WebAuthn. And we learned so much from that. And it's fascinating watching users do things like try to use Touch ID on a MacBook to log into a fictitious bank site. And watching like this, this focus group, someone being like, wait a second, like, why does it want my fingerprint? And why does this bank want my fingerprint? And why do they want this? And so what we learned is that there's a lot of education that needs to happen about like, hey, first of all, your fingerprint's not leaving, but also all the user flows they're in. And most of the design stuff that we figured out was not about iconography and colors and stuff like that. It's about terminology and getting information across effectively and letting people know what's happening and like selectively disclosing information as they go along to help walk them through the entire user journey from being primed <coughs> to enroll for WebAuthn you know, for, for your account on through to login and customer support and stuff like that. So there's a lot of science behind this and, and we're trying to take that on as a body and then making these guidelines freely available to anyone to use, which they are today and they are being utilized. Uh, you submitted the studies on this. Before we move on to Christian, just an additional follow-up on that one. You submitted the studies in the US, fine. Uh, I'm from Norway. And I will make the claim there are social and cultural differences between, well, different cultures, uh, different countries across borders, across uh, <laughs> nations, everything. Have this been tested out in European countries? Has it been tested out in Germany, which are just a tad more privacy concerned than anyone else in the world? I, I, just, I just want to act that before Andrew answers, I will say, we're seeing statistically significant difference in, in, in pass rates, users being able to pass this, I mean, looking at different jurisdictions. So absolutely, there is definitely differences that we see in ways that we need to approach that. Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything more to add to this? You know, how to... Do you want to talk about the developer side? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we can yeah. go to the technical side as yeah. well. It's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, even yeah. just high level for developers, right? The, the, yeah. All, all of everything that you saw um, today was very minor tweaks to the existing FIDO2 WebAuthn stack, right? We the the autofill is literally adding a new tag to a username field. The cross device thing is not something you, as a relying party or website, have to implement. That's all handled by the platform. All that magic is is handled um, at that CTAP layer that Christian uh, mentioned, client to authenticator protocol. Um, and so, one thing that we think is different here is that we have a very very clean, specific use case now, right? Which when all of these specifications came out, right, there was, you know, if you've ever read any spec, right, you know they're they're very hard to read, right? No matter how hard we, no matter how hard we try to, to, to make them easier to read, and I'm one of the people who writes some of them, um, they're just, they're too big, um, they're hard for a developer to pick up. And so what's unique here is, you know, the goal that we have for some new developer resources is that if a developer that has a site that the only reason they added SMS OTP or, or email magic link was because they're, you know, they were told, you know, passwords are fishable and we can't have that. They should be able to go to the site and implement pass keys without ever picking up the WebAuthn spec, right? That's the goal, right? Like we never, we, we may not even link to it. <laughs> That's what we're thinking. Um, and that, that would, that didn't, that really wasn't possible before because there's just, when you, when you start looking at a spec like that, there's so many different use cases it's addressing. And we really have a very clean, very boxed in use case here that applies to nearly everyone. And the other dimension to it is we didn't have any good libraries at the time, right? There were some like reference implementations, but again, they were served either not enough use cases or too many use cases. 
there's a one um, one specific library called Simple Web Authn that is already ready for all this passkey stuff. We found a bug in it last week. It was fixed in two days. Right? We have amazing libraries that no one has to go write this stuff themselves anymore. And we think that that's a that's a big change from the first go around with trying to get folks to implement this. And when why do I then have developers telling me that implementing this stuff is difficult? No, I, and I, I think it, it was, and I think what we're hoping is because we have kind of a big a, a big package now that can be whether it's the SDK, whether it's the docs, everything should be ready to go and and much easier to implement and dive into initially than it was before. And that's from Microsoft's perspective. It's uh, easy and ready it, to it's go. A, yeah, th these these resources are actually a collaboration between Indeed. Fido and the three companies. So. Okay. Uh, sure, that's certainly my perspective. But yeah, I, think I, 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 think, I think the dots aren't being connected quite yet, and that is definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to internal business development relationship folks in Google this week, finally, where we're saying, all right, we can now take a breather. Most of the technology pieces are now there, and we're on our journey, and by the way, Apple mentioned that by the end of the year they want to have their releases out. We're on the same time frame, right? So um, on, on the Android side, by the end of this year, we're sincerely hoping that we have a release out there that is not only ready for testing, but is actually ready for developing and deploying against. So, so uh, many of the things that I've, that I've shown, I mean, all of the stuff that I've shown is real live running code, right? Nothing there was mocked up, it was real code. Um, it was, you know, behind some flags and experiments, but, but, but the, the pitch is, these things should be ready by the end of the year. Um, there, there should not be a reason why developers, you know, can't get access to that, and then on the other side get access to the resources. But like I said about the dots, I don't think developers know that you can go and look at this great new library over here, and you should be looking at this docs over here. People Google Web of N, they get to the spec, and they're like, what the hell is this? And I, I think that, that really is something that we need to address. So back to my business folks, it's like, we want to try and make it easy. Like, if we can get relationship started with the developers, and I mean, that includes the top 100 apps, but it includes also all of the long tail. Like, how does someone pick this stuff up? The last thing I'll add is, um, whereas we need to make sure there is messages for developers or messaging for developers, I think we've already lost if we need to pitch this to end users, right? If we need to go pitch the value proposition, like today with security keys, yeah. you need to take an action. You need to buy one, and then you need to go and navigate on a website and look for multi-factor options and look for security keys. If this is the way that WebAuthn is going to be deployed, it'll be a huge failure, in my opinion, right? WebAuthn should be deployed the way that biometric authentication works today, which is, as a matter of course, when you're just interacting with the product, there should be an upsell, it should be easy to understand in plain language, one to two sentences at most, and it should start working. No one should go digging through settings to enable an account for WebAuthn, because that already means you need this cognitive kind of understanding of how things interact. That is not the way that we're thinking WebAuthn should be done. Right, and one example of this, there's a, there's a very large retailer in the US, which we're super excited they rolled out WebAuthn, <laughs> but guess what? That. Their login page says, sign in with WebAuthn. Like that's what the button says. Yeah, like the, the, what, who, what, who knows what that means, yeah, right? Like, yeah. like as a user. And kudos to and them, that's they, like, they were a first adopter. Right, no, and that's but, what I mean. We are super happy they implemented it, but that that highlighted a market yeah. problem, which we yeah. was exactly. the reason we needed a, a generic term like Passkey. Yeah, or Fido. But, but uh, you said that, you know, people will just Google for WebAuthn and then they find the standard and they will say, you know, what the hell is this? Exactly, exactly. I, well, you're the owners of the search engine, so I yes. assume something could be done. Well, we don't so have control over the search engine results, remember? But, but uh, yes, I agree. Uh, the, I agree. Yeah, the search but engine what? is just living its own life. So, yeah. yeah. But one one side effect, which I think is good, like inside Fido Alliance, like the like within what three weeks after we started using the term passkey. You, we didn't hear web authentic again. Everyone was saying passkey. Yeah, so that's yeah. a nice thing is if we get, <laughs> hopefully people are actually finding the passkey resources, well, not web authentic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be clear, we, we, we actually invested in uh, creating kind of a consumer brand option for Fido. So we had sign in with Fido buttons, which is, I still think, better than sign with web authentic, but whatever. So the market, but the market didn't accept it, which okay. is fine, you know? <laughs> and we have, we have a mark with that, but we, we put it out there as a straw man, the market didn't accept it, and that's fine. You know, but we understood there needs to be a name for something. Right, and so we we do think that passkey as a noun will be that name. Yeah, but but that's what I want to. I, I want to. I, I mean, the reason why we're here is like I want to also put it out to the room here. The folks here are the like this is our ambassadors. Like hopefully, like help us in getting the word out. Like resources and developer efforts and libraries. Like I mean, that that is really what we need. We can put forth like our perspective and and, and you know collectively maybe our three organizations, but. Um, we will really only have success if this is like almost like a grassroots effort between everyone involved and the, the, the experts in this area, kind of like using the technology, making it their own, and releasing their own artifacts. Like that is how we get success here, I think.
Anyone in the audience would like to ask questions? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. well that, that, I didn't have to ask that question. Any developers that are thinking about implementing WebAuthn, but they would like to ask a couple of questions on, you know, how do I do this? Or if you find it difficult, raise your hand. That, yep. Okay. Yeah, I can't hear. Hi, I'm a developer. Oh. I read a little bit about uh, Fido and the web as well. Oh, I'm going to go and give it a try on a demo. And I kind of drowned in the documentation. It was like a month and a half ago. I was like, oh my god, I'm not going anywhere here. Yeah. So I, I think you guys are doing a great job, but uh, maybe uh, make it easier for the developers. Yeah. That, that would be great. Yeah. But, uh, and also, I'm very happy that you guys came here, but I'm missing one uh, big actor. Uh, it would be nice if Apple was here too, to get some bit of you can, feedback. You can check Twitter and like, like it, it, it's not anything but like we're still in a position where it's hard for folks to travel and things like that. But we're still but in yeah. a pandemic. So. Yeah. 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 But uh, when you say we want people to collaborate, maybe we should be giving people like the idea of community, like the final yeah. community, yeah. so people feel like they can. Well, so that's actually code. so yeah. the the actually the 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 developer resources that I'm talking about, which will end up being passkeys.dev will be the website once it's live. That's actually being driven by a community group in the W3C called the WebAuthn Community Adoption Group, which maybe we'll need to rename the passkey adoption group. Yeah. Um, but that is oh, actually anyone, you know, anyone can join. We meet every two weeks um, and actually it's myself and Matt Miller from Cisco who is actually, we're actually taking the output of that group, feedback, resources, and building out this developer resource center. So please, I can, I can, uh, yeah. If you Google WebAuthn Community Adoption Group, it'll come yeah, right up. That, that's what, not the thing. WebAuthn is a bad word. Yeah, no, yeah, I know, and, like, and that's just, what I'm saying. We just, may, just we probably need to rename it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's an artifact of the past, I guess. Past but, but that is, but yeah. it, we are, we do have a, I would say, a pretty good sense of community in that group. There's also, there's also a, uh, where's this thing? There's also a Fido Dev uh, mail list if you're if you're under issues. Yeah. So a pretty, I mean, it's not a super vibrant group, but there, there is a Fido Dev Google group that you can mail to if you run into issues yeah. as well. Yeah. Next. Hello. Uh, I just had one question to make sure I'm understanding the security model around the pass keys, right? So the WebAuthn U2F, more specifically, I guess, is a very decentralized security model, right? The private key doesn't leave token yep. concept, right? This is now a switch over to the credentials are essentially being managed by the vendor, right? So there is a, a shift there, I yep. think, mentally that we need to make sure we're okay with or we're thinking about the implications yeah. of that. Is that yeah. an accurate way to capture it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah. I, let me give you my, my perspective on this, right? So, so uh, yes, to a certain extent, I think, I think we were trying to figure out in, in which way what are different ways in which we can address this, right? Um, the, the challenge around every single time you buy a new device, we're going to know you're going to be up shit quick, right? And, and that's essentially what happens to the current model. And that's also what happens to the physical authenticator. When you lose that authenticator, you're so dead, right? So now we recommend get you. I mean, okay, that's maybe for like for, for folks with like wallets that can go buy these. I mean, that's fine. But in a general consumer adoption thing, we looked at what already has traction. And what is traction is password managers, right? Also, not the level of traction we really want them to have, but, but they have traction. And it's because of synchronization. We then looked at what is the best kind of like line that we can weave through here, which is like, uh, don't place this as files on disk, like have the OS like kind of mediate the access to them. There are certain additional security properties, but you're right. It looks, if you squint at it, it looks a little bit more like federation than what WebAuthn used to look. It still isn't quite federation because it's still a direct two-party relationship, right? It's between the, the authenticator and the developer. Yes, there is another third party like meddling here in the middle now, which is doing the synchronization. But if you think about it, Google has a thousand folks that is purely tasked with making sure that bad guys don't get into good users Google accounts, right? You're now leveraging, if you're, if you're using pass keys in this way, you're essentially leveraging the fact that we're already have all that protection and all that investment and in making sure only the right users get access to the right Google accounts, you're leveraging that. Now it might be that you have a particular use case where, <coughs> excuse me, even that level isn't good enough. You need to take responsibility of your own, you know, I, I guess like uh, direction here. And if that's what you want to do, there are certain things in the specification that allows you more granularity where you yes. don't have to rely on the synchronization. I will say, use that with caution because that, what that will mean is when the user changes to a new device, 
they're going to have to start over. And unless you have a good story there, and I and, and I think that's another, I don't want to get into that because that's kind of like where some of the, vo- the viewpoints between like what Google's doing, Microsoft's doing, and Apple doing differs a little bit. It's like how much of that control do we give developers and how much of that co- of control do we give developers in the initial release? We're very worried that this might go a way where the usability suffers because of a perceived security, look at per shirt, right? I mean, that's exactly that, right? We we shouldn't yeah. all be trying to dial this up to 11 because of some perceived risk, and then in the meantime, usability suffers and no one uses the technology. So I, I mean, I'm being a little vague here, but I just want to mention, well, yes, you're taking a new, like a new, uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking on this, but I'll, I'll say you, you are you are taking another, uh, um, you know, um, uh, an additional dependency, but I think it's a net positive and not a net negative. Yeah, I'd say the same thing. So one added point I want to make is, so it does change FIDO security posture, fundamentally. But I want to point out this was not done without a lot of deliberation and a lot of conversation internally. This wasn't done flippantly or without a lot of, a lot of, a lot of conversation. Ultimately, as Christian said, it's the greater good, right? So our goal, FIDO's mission since day one has been to reduce reliance on passwords. And this stands to do that, taking, again, passwords out of play for so many consumer use cases um, that we decided that this change is, is worth it. And that being said, also, there are ways to work on this spec. You can, you can actually still, using passkey, um, allow for some you know, device-bound characteristics. Additionally, you know, for specialized use cases, enterprise IT, highly regulated use cases, and so on and so forth, FIDO security keys will still be the default go-to approach, and that won't change. And, and just um, one other important thing, right? Um, the pass keys in your account will be end-to-end encrypted, right? So that's an encrypted blob to Google, Microsoft, and Apple. They're end-to-end encrypted like other end-to-end encrypted data. So yes, we manage how they get down to the device, but you have to unlock them, right? And, and we'll have really security policies problem. also. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was, I was wondering what, um, what are the... Um, what have you been uh, discussing regarding um, account recovery um, when it comes to this and like the issues with vendor lock-in that arise as a result of um, putting the authentication in the device? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll try and briefly just answer this in case you know some of my colleagues here also want to get in. But I, I, I think um, you're absolutely right. This, this, this. Again, hinges on the fact that, like with many other user data, like you, you have data. There is data now that's sitting somewhere, and you need to, like with any other data, it's your data, right? You need to have the ability to get that data out of the ecosystem if you ever want to move somewhere else. We definitely recognize that. Um, you know, how we do that in a secure way. With passwords, it's kind of like a little easier because we all know passwords are like effy and, you know, you have other second factors. But like I said, if we want passkeys to be something where you don't necessarily need a second factor, now suddenly that bar is higher, right? And what do you do? Now, Apple and Google have both said, um, I mean, Apple has their um, white paper on essentially how the passkey mechanism works. They also have the one iCloud, uh, you know, uh, keychain encryption. Google will do the same thing, right? So we will also, like like Tim said, like it's going to be end-to-end encrypted. Um, we're already you know, very, very similar to, to iCloud Keychain. Um, firstly, you need access to the Google account. Now, we are trying, tr- we're trying to drive a multi-factor adoption of Google accounts um, by default, right? And that's not an accident. That is that is part that is part of the foundation what you really need for this to be successful, right? It doesn't help to say passkeys is as good as second factor, but then the recovery is a single factor thing that someone can just guess, right? So that needs to be solved, number one. The second thing that needs to be solved is, or the second thing that we're doing is similar to Apple, um, just having access to the account is not enough. Um, you also need to have access to some other information. The information that Apple chose, the information that Google is choosing to do is, you need to know how to unlock one of the devices that was previously part of your, call it sync fabric, like whatever that local lock screen. That's actually used as a derived key for as part of the end-to-end encryption mechanism that we use. Um, so we think mandatory like 2SV, which we're trying to like drive in, plus that factor, Plus all the other additional, I mean, I had a slide that I didn't show here, but like, if you think about it, over 99.9% of automated attacks where an attacker has your correct Google password will block. We won't allow them in because there are so many other things that we know about attackers and where they come from and how they look. So all of that benefits are there. And on top of that, we then layer the 2SV, we layer the, the additional like screen unlock. So we think we have a very, a, a pretty strong and a pretty robust system. If after that you say, no, 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 I still need additional security for my use cases, there are things in the spec that enable that. But I think for most relying parties, we're hoping that that where we've set the bar is essentially where we'd like to where we'd like to keep it. I'll get in front of one question just briefly by also saying, 
We're not saying this has to be keys always stored in Apple or it has to be keys always stored in Google. That is our initial implementation. But we are very much of the opinion that we need to do what we've done with password managers and we need to make allow an open user choice, right? If you want to use a, a credential, call it now credential manager, password manager, a third party one, we need to allow for good pluggable architectures to make that possible. But you can imagine how much more complex that decision tree now is for a relying party or a developer because Google end-to-end -end encrypts. Does password manager XYZ end-to-end -end encrypt? What is their security properties when it comes to account recovery? So all these things have to be taken into account. Um, we think we have solutions, but we would actually love to have a separate conversation about those kind of things with folks providing password managers and credential managers so that we can design the system in a way that makes sense for developers and for users. And, and even in the short term, right, if you, if you look at, I would recommend looking at some of the Apple's demos, right? Apple's done a fantastic job about merging. Like you can have your pass keys in iCloud Keychain, but using LastPass for your passwords, and they all come up in the same UI, and you just pick which one you want to use, right? So there's also the convergence there in, I would say, what is the short term until we have a fully pluggable model where you can punch your pass keys over to LastPass or whatever password manager yeah, you want. Yeah. So a uh, question from uh, Twitter. Uh, what is FIDO doing to continue to provide high security authentication with the introduction of pass keys that are lower security? Well, lower security, I take offense, but I will let... <laughs> but I think we, I think we kind of hit on that, right? So yeah, I also disagree with low on security for all the, the reasons that we just talked about. So There's a different model. Right? Thank you, Twitter user, yes. But I, I think, um, yes, it's a different model. And, and again, I think that, um, you know, I like to say that you know, FIDO can address address a whole range of use cases, right? So again, if you, you know, we have a, a very robust certification program, we actually certify authenticators at different levels uh, to protect, you know, to, to verify that a, a, a physical authenticator protects against malware attacks or brute force attacks or hardware attacks. You know, so if that's your use case, you can use one of these certified authenticators for that. Uh, I think again, the, the base level FIDO security key uh, will remain, you know, the default go to for you know high security profile use cases. Uh, beyond that, I, I, again, I think the, the security properties of Passkey are not weak. They're not weak at all. Um, and there's, you know, in fact, I was talking this morning uh, with the, the head of authentication at, at a major uh, bank in the US. I was like, hey, how are you guys looking at Passkey? What do you think about this? How do you feel about the security posture? His point is like, Andrew, that's a bunch of bullshit. He's like, the, the gap between what I'm doing now, which is SMS OTP, and what I get with Passkey, the, 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 the bar has risen so much from that. Right, so maybe there's some use cases where like a high transaction or certain scenarios where I want to get added data or added bullet points. In that case, you know, I could take a passkey as just a single signal, feed it into my risk engine and do other sorts of step up or other sorts of data to make sure that's a, a secure authentication. But ultimately, passkey raises the bar so high from the default means of authentication today that I don't think it's fair to say it's a weak security approach. So I, I, have, two, I have two quick questions. Um, I think a lot of people's concern when they're talking lower security is in comparison to what the FIDO2 does right yeah. now, which yep. I, I do prefer the FIDO2 model. I recognize the failings and like, well, now you've got to register on every site. Um, but the quick question is, one of the fundamentals of FIDO2 originally was the key existed on the device and it would never surrender it for any reason. How do you know a key hasn't been cloned off? Like. Is it possible for a key to get cloned off? Maybe you authenticated it through some, um, you know, you didn't realize what the page is showing, you click something, and then there's a clone out there that you're not aware of, and that key is there. Is there any way to revoke credentials? Um, so that's the first question. I, I mean, I, I'll let other folks also answer this. I think that Tim Michael said that further, but I'll, I'll just quickly mention that. I mean, remember, um, the QR code flow and all these things, it's not actually your private key ever that mm -hmm. goes over. The only time that that will happen is when the user decides to sign in to a, like, to a new iOS device, to a new macOS device, like in the Apple ecosystem, or to a new Android device where, where there is, like, okay, maybe you can kind of contrive this attack, like this contrive attack where, like, you know, the user thinks they're giving a Google account credentials to, like, a phishing site, and then the bad guy runs an emulator at the back that looks like a real Android device, and they use that to pull the credentials down. I mean, we have a lot of... Um, technology and signals around are we dealing with real legitimate devices or not. So I think everything there feeds into our decision on whether or not we want to allow the credential syncing to come down to the device. 
Um, if a user does it, let's say, let's say, I mean, um, you convince me on your Android phone to type my credentials in there, type my previous screen unlock in everything, and now all my credentials are on that particular device. Let's say that's the attack that we're talking about, right? Okay, now my credentials are there. I've got two options. When I, if I realize it, I hope I do at some point. Um, I can either go and I can go to, you know, settings and I can go and sign out that device, which essentially then invalidates the pass keys, like almost like a remote wipe, right? I can go do that. Or I can go to the various s accounts for which I hold pass keys. But, but this is the difference in, let me kind of take an analogy, right? I lose my wallet. Can I call one number to just block? Okay, sure. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I block my entire wallet or do I have to call all five credit card companies? Do I have to call up all five credit card companies? That's not great. You have that option with pass keys. You can go to the sites and individually revoke the pass key on that device, but I would say mostly you would just go and like remove the account of the device, which immediately will invalidate all the pass keys. So just to clarify on that, um, each, each device has a unique credential that there's some mechanism that it authenticates with, like it, it's either a signing chain or are they all sharing a credential? In the Android world, there is some uniqueness that can be used as part of the uh, risk detection. Um, not all platforms support that mechanism, but there is something to tie back onto. There is caveats there, but but there is a capability. I don't know to right, but ju just just to answer more specifically, if I have an Android phone and an Android tablet signed in the same Google account, it is the same credential on both devices. Okay. So if I revoke it from TriBank, both of those devices lose access. Right. Okay. Just like a security key today. And then the other question was because everything on like say a YubiKey now is done. Um, locally and the way the mechanism works, the low-level mechanism, um, you can do two-factor authentication or even passwordless with um, out leaking a lot of information on what sites you're doing, stuff like that. What type of like metadata analysis could Google, Facebook, or anyone in the FIDO Alliance be now um, open to um, because they're involved in the syncing process? Is it as the, limited the, as like actually? The, there's no change, right? Because the pass keys tied to your account are end-to-end -end encrypted, right? So there's no change in that model. What's that? Which, which metadata are you, which metadata are you referring to, though? Um, the credential so, metadata? So right now, we're definitely encrypting all the private keys. Um, to encrypt the metadata has issues regarding the way that we render that on the usability side. So the mechanism that it'll work today, metadata won't be encrypted, but there's also no mining or anything of that. But but technically, that's something that we could add, or that's something that if you choose to use a different provider in the future, that they might provide for usability reasons, we encrypt the private keys and not the metadata today. But that's something that there's for no reason other than just there's a usability constraint on that for us. Yeah, uh, I have a question regarding dual security keys. Uh, I've implemented a couple of these web authentication sites and tried to do the password. Sorry, sorry. Uh, just uh, very soft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Beat the AC. Um, yeah. Much louder. Put it in my mouth. Um, yeah, I developed a lot of this. Uh, or I'm an early adopter and I try to implement a lot of this web authentication. What I've felt lacking in the documentation or the implementations from before is like the um, support for dual security keys. So I want to have my computer that has a DPM and such, and also my security key that is attached to my yeah keychain to be able to do this yeah co-op the login. How are your thoughts about that? So just to make sure I understand the question, like like dual security keys. So being able to use or need to use both at the same time for an authentication. I mean, that's technically already possible. It's like a relying party choice. It's kind of like almost like a workflow where the relying party today can make the decision and saying, hey, I need my criteria as a password plus a security key or my criteria as a security key plus SMS OTP or my criteria as two security keys. I mean, that's something that is totally implementable uh, from a workflow perspective on the relying party, not something that the spec needs, needs to change to, to, to support. Uh, yeah, so my question kind of goes along with some of the questions that you had earlier. And, uh, th uh, but my scenario is more of the sense of the user trying to recover their account when their device is lost, stolen, or no longer accessible. They're traveling for business, yeah. vacation, whatever else. They, they, they have to resort to a machine at the hotel, whatever, to log in to access their information, whether it's bank, whatever else. What is a user's option to be able to access their account when they don't have access to their uh, devices that's already been in the ecosystem? Super tough question. Probably the toughest one that anyone has asked today, right? And that is, that is ultimately like, how do I 
no, it's the right user, and it's not someone pretending to be the user in this exact scenario, right? Um, the, the easy answer today is going to be, you're gonna need to prove to us that like it's you through something. Um, you will, you know, if, if there is no signal, if it's not coming from a known IP address or like a location or something that we know about you, which is, you know, we've got many different types of signals, um, you know, if in the future, the idea is that we remove passwords of Google accounts. So there will not be a password. That will not be a signal that you can provide us anymore, right? Because it's a, such a weak signal. But then the question is, what can you provide us? Well, maybe you can tell us about how you unlocked your previous phone, but then where are you gonna tell that to us? To the kiosk machine? You know, maybe that's okay, but the question is also, even if you can get into that kiosk machine, we can't really make your pass keys usable from there because then that means they will be leaking onto the kiosk machine. So it is a very, this is a very tough problem. Um, we're kicking the can down the road a little bit where we say, well, if you can at least get access to like another phone, like a new one or someone else's, you can sign in there, like then then maybe you can sync things down. But it's it's very hard because it's, it's clearly a usability issue, but it is also such a, big security issue if we let the wrong user in or sync the credentials to a shared terminal, then we don't have a perfect answer for that today. But that is a problem that users are already experiencing right now. But I think one potential thing, right? So let's assume that their phone got stolen, but their laptop didn't. We do have the ability to reverse that cross device flow. Yeah. It's just a little awkward right now turning your laptop to scan a QR code. Um, that the protocol allows that, right? We just haven't enabled that experience. So you could, in theory, use your laptop that didn't get stolen because in your hotel room to right. get back into your Google account by reversing the flow. It's, it's totally possible, and Apple's actually already supporting it for iPad and Mac. It's well. if you have nothing that we're stuck. Right, right. Like, they don't have access. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Hey, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you for your time, by the way. Um, how do you see uh, onboarding working for first-time login? Like, say you had no relationship to that tri-bank. No account, no nothing, no existing account. How do you see that working? And can you complete that workflow without ever ever making a password? Yeah. That, that, that's the goal, right? I would say, I, I hope in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll start to see the first truly passwordless accounts with pass keys, right? The way we see this, right, you, you, you still probably have to capture name and email address and phone number, and then maybe when you hit submit, it invokes, web, it invokes the API, creates a pass key, and away you go, you're on your way. So the password field is gone. You never capture a password in the first place. Yeah. And there are there are sites that are already, very small number, um, but there are already sites that are doing that today, but we hope the user experience will be much cleaner with this. Yeah, and certain service providers are onboarding people without passwords today based on other uh, proprietary data they might have. Like a, a telco, for example, has account information about them or other network API data they can use. Um, we're also inside of FIDO Alliance. We have, we're doing some standardization work around identity proofing and verification. Um, which if we pull off, which is you know very complex, I think actually stands to have as much impact on the market and this whole problem as the authentication piece does. Uh, that's still pretty nascent, um, although we do have, we'll have our first uh, doc auth requirements document out in the next, uh, next couple months. Uh, okay. um, it's, it's really good to hear that you're taking on so uh, skilled uh, usability uh, team. Uh, to uh, work on your usability, because my primary uh, worry is, and then I get divorced. What happened? I, I managed to set up all my devices, but all of a sudden, I am now gonna untangle myself from the complexity that I've just made. Am I able to? Do I understand this? Or what if I die? What happens? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one yeah. for you, uh, Christian. But well, I, well, I, well, well, no, Tim. Well, just like password manager, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, th there's, well, if you want no, to no, say, no, I, I, I'll just say, it's like, it's like the password manager today. It's, 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 I'm, I'm not saying the problem is solved, but it's very similar to what you already have with password manager. It's not a manager problem. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. There, we're not, we're not, necessarily solving everything, right? These are not ne necessarily net new, but that's part of iterating over time too, right? Like we've already seen Apple iterate on some of the digital legacy stuff that, a lot, that is thinking about that, right? So that's something we can enable over time as we start to think about what are the security implications of sharing a passkey, right? Like all of these different, how do you pull that passkey back? Is it better, you know, one question we keep asking, is it better for me to send you my passkey for my Netflix account or just have you add a passkey to my Netflix account? Right, these are the, these are the things we're starting to think about all around re revocability and all these models. Netflix so, says neither. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Terms of service official, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Netflix, I think, is very happy about passkeys. <laughs> now they are. Yeah.
Yeah, I just I have basically the same question about shared devices. It's a really common use case. Our customers are commonly coming to. I work at Slack, and they they want the ability to have checkout personnel use the same iPad yep. and have a secure experience yep. logging in, logging out. Yeah, so that that's actually so the one thing um, you know Christian's demo is really great showing the cross device flow where we step up and create you a passkey on the local device. The other flip side of that use case, which we will heavily use in Windows, right? Uh, the example I always use is a gate agent at the airport, right? You never want to create local passkeys on that terminal. You always want to use the cross device flow. So the shared device flow, the shared device scenario is one where you will always want to use that cross device and never, never even, you may not even want to keep the relationship between that phone and that device. It's completely ephemeral. And in right? some cases, maybe even a security key is right. better or, than a phone there, right? Like tap the security key, it personalizes, and then when you remove it, it and, and, and those are great examples of, you know, you know, the, the question we got, uh, I think last night at dinner was like, well, this is, this is a consumer feature, right? And the answer is it's targeted at very consumer centric use cases. But if you look at a, a frontline worker in a retail environment, uh, you know, I can tell you as Azure AD identity provider, they're using SMS sign and this is instantly better. And those are quote unquote enterprise scenarios, right? So yeah. the gate agent use case, same thing. Like what is, what is better them using a, a fishable mechanism or this phishing resistant thing that may or may not be on their personal phone or a managed device. It's still better and in, in a better user experience, less fishable. Yeah. We shouldn't rule out Paskey for the enterprise. No, but what's, what's the Azure day? Like 28% of Azure clients are using MFA. Yeah, yeah. So if we can move that up, you know, 10, 20% yeah. by use of Paskey's. Yeah, that's that's a great thing. Yeah. And, and Christian alluded to right where we are. We have added to the to the specifications options for enterprises. Or I hate the term enterprise. Work, school, higher security. You could argue that like a Twitter verified user is closer to an enterprise user than a consumer, as one example. So where uh, you know there are there are mechanisms in the spec to to accommodate those that you'll start to see uh, implemented. So we are we are getting close to the time. Where I have to uh, end this. Uh, there will also be a one hour break before we continue. But again, uh, this one's for you first, Andrew. Um, privacy in this. I mean, security is one thing. Privacy is part of security. It is also something different. So have you looked into if this pass keys, FIDO, web of and U2F, or whatever you want to call it, you should really look into standardizing stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 On the privacy part of things, have you looked into whether this technology will improve privacy or if it also introduces new privacy difficulties for people in any way whatsoever? Like my friend Cecilia asking, well, when, what about when I got get divorced? Is it then suddenly harder to maintain good privacy as an example? Yeah, but that's a great question. And, and this is the type of discussion we're having inside of FIDO Alliance today. So I'm not going to give you a really square answer on that. We have a security and privacy working group that's looking at these issues, coming up with the best kind of a canonical approach, if you will, for how one should implement Passkey to um, to adhere to FIDO's privacy principles that we've had since day one. Yeah, and so I think there's certainly already implications. There's, there's, so there's that conversation happening. The other thing we do as a body actively is we engage with regulators, um, you know, across the world to understand how you know FIDO authentication in, in our various forms fits in with current and emerging you know, privacy. And regulatory policies. Right. So, I mean, like any new technology that we introduce in FIDO Alliance or elsewhere that impacts user authentication, uh, we look at it closely inside the alliance and figure out, you know, how FIDO's um, best practices and specifications can meet, you know, the privacy needs. So, yeah, well, one one thing that, I'll, and I'll speak specifically for Microsoft on this. Um, one thing that has come up uh, in the past few months for us is thinking about how easy it is for users to use consumer federated sign in. Right, Paskey has the opportunity to remove the need to do consumer federated signing, which has serious privacy implications. Right, you're telling that identity provider everywhere you're signing in. Now, on the enterprise side, that's what people pay for. Right, you're paying for federation, you're paying to track employees because you need to enforce policy. On the consumer side, they're doing it because it's easy. So it's back to whoever asked the sign up flow. If that sign up flow is as frictionless as as clicking sign in with X that I won't name. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I know, just kidding. We have it too, me. technically. No one uses it, but um, no. Uh, uh, no, so if we can make that as, as frictionless as possible, um, then you could make the argument that consumer federation with these big, big identity providers could and maybe should go down significantly over time. I'll, I'll say one thing for 30 seconds to see those point, right? I think a lot of the a lot of the questions around, like, I mean, there there is a whole you know slew of use cases, which I won't even go into because they're all super depressing. 
but around you know whether or not users should get access and what happens when folks break up and like there's there's this whole and I think a lot of that isn't so much the protocol it's around the implementation of the protocol and that's good and bad because that means hey the protocol is done but that also means relying parties need to take ownership of those experiences themselves I know we're having discussions at Google around like what does it mean to give someone access to you know in, rather than typing a Google account password, now you can just use the screen lock on the device. What if that's a you know a spouse's device? What if that's the shared kid's tablet? Like, how do I revoke that? And I think we're trying to think through those and implement uh, you know particular workflows. But the but the downside is that means every single relying party need to do the same thing. And 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 I think that can be tricky. And I think we're gonna you know folks will get it wrong. Like I think you know we're gonna like it, it'll but. But I think we are absolutely trying to think through those use cases because we do realize that they are important. And, and use cases on this, uh, I, I think, that, well, I, I know that Cecilia and myself, we will most definitely be looking into the abusability aspects yeah, of this absolutely. For, the, for, the, for the next weeks and months and years as well. We are really interested in this stuff. So it's interesting. Um, we are getting very, very close. Um, I want the sales pitch for this. Because, and based on me saying, there is no risk analysis and there is no business case justifying the removal of passwords. So, try me. Yeah. Uh, give I'll, me the sense. I'm going to give you a hot tell take. Me I'm a, tell me I'm wrong. Tim. I'm going to give you a hot take one. Yep. How much is your SMS cost? Your SMS service? How much do you pay per year? I could tell you. I should, I'm not going to tell you what Microsoft is. <laughs> it, we're talking millions of dollars across these companies for even just an SMS based sign in. Right, that, that's not the primary reason, but that's a hot take that often has come up in discussions is what, what do these other methods actually cost that are completely unnecessary if the primary factor is phishing resistant? Christian, I will, sales pitch. I mean, I, I haven't prepared this one, but I guess my talking points here would be something along the lines of if you're not removing the password and you're making the password safer, you're adding something. Adding something comes at the, like, you're immediately the moment you're adding, you're 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 taking you, you know you're making usability worse. Like that is just insecurity. Like the, the moment there's something additive, security is being made worse. The only way where we can make usability better or keep it on par, while adding the security protection, is taking something away. And what is the thing we can take away? It's certainly not Fido. It must be I mean, ergo. It must be the password. Like that. That is my argument here to make. I, we, we need to talk more afterwards. Okay, well, uh, that's it for, for this panel discussion. I'm really, really incredibly happy that you come, Andrew, Christian, and Tim. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you folks. I'll, I'll be around at the pool yeah. thing tonight, so yeah, if folks want to ask questions <laughs> like outside, we, yeah. can, we can talk yeah, more. Yeah, I, I, I you, presume you, you will beer. stay on yeah. here as well. Absolutely. So, uh, use the next hour to talk to them or do something else, and we'll continue at 5 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>